Alrighty, we are rolling right along here and are in our final set of notes for Unit 1, Scientific Foundations for AP Psych. This one all being all about statistics. So this one's kind of a heavy one. If you're in like an AP stats course, you have a little bit of an advantage, but I'm really gonna try to simplify this stuff for you and making sure that we're only hitting what you absolutely need to understand for psychology. So make sure you've got those notes. They're linked below in my TPT store if you don't have them yet. And let's get started. All right, so statistical reasoning and what we have to understand about this statistic stuff is that it's all about research, right? The stats in our research and how we can use numbers to display what it is our research has found. So we have statistical procedures that analyze and interpret data from our research and they let us see what the unaided eye might miss. So for instance, this is the census income for the state that I live in, which is Ohio. And I would encourage you to go to, what is it, um, data.census.gov to see what that census informa information is for your state. But the population is over 11 million people. The median household income is $54,000. There's a 14% poverty rate, as well as a 59.6% employment rate, not unemployment, employment rate. It's almost 60% of the population is employed. So describing data is really the first step that statistics takes for us. So meaningful description of data is important in research, just describing what it's saying. So misrepresentation can lead to incorrect conclusions. So if you look at these two graphs, these are telling us the exact same thing. But the first graph says, oh, there's really, really no difference. But if we're ex like zoom in on it, wow, brand Z sucks right? There can definitely be some misleading information there. All right, so descriptive data or statistics would first be measures of central tendency. And these are probably just going to be refreshers for you. But it's mean, median, and mode. Mean being the arithmetic average of scores in a distribution obtained by adding the scores and dividing by the total number. The median being the middle score in a rank order distribution and the mode being the most, most frequently occurring score in a distribution. Then we have what's called measures of variation. So first we have range and range is the difference between the highest and the lowest scores in a distri distribution, right? Like how, what is the range of ages of people in your family? It could be like, a newborn all the way up to like 90 years old, right? The lowest and the highest, that is your range. Then you have what's called standard deviation. Standard meaning average, deviation meaning difference, right? To be deviant means to differentiate or be different from. So it's the average difference between each score and the average and the mean. So it's the average difference between each score and the mean. So what I have here are depicted are two distributions of scores. So the red one, for instance, has a very small standard deviation because it also has a small range. The average distance or difference between each score and the average is really small. So you see that it's really tight there. You could say that that standard deviation is of 10. Whereas the blue graph has a much wider range and therefore a much wider standard deviation of 50 because there's a wider range of scores. So let's talk a little more specific about that standard deviation. Here's the thing. You will not at least in this course, AP Psychology, you will not be asked to calculate standard deviation, but you do need to apply what you know of the concept. You have to understand it conceptually. For example, what, which of the following sets of data has the greatest standard deviation? So look at each of those bullet points I have there for you. So hopefully you look in between each of the numbers, right? This one's one to 30, right? So there's a difference of four, a difference of three, and then a difference of like a lot there. Isn't that like 23 or something? And then this one is a difference of five, two, and a five. This one's a difference of two, two, and one. So that last one has the smallest difference. This one in the middle has probably the next smallest, but because of that seven to 30 jump, 
that top one really has the biggest standard deviation. And you could really figure that out in most cases because of the range. So again, how did you figure this out? You can estimate standard deviation by looking at the spread or the range of the numbers. You could also find the mean and compare each number to the mean if you wanted to go the longer route. All right, let's talk normal distribution. All right, a normal distribution is a distribution of scores that produces a bell-shaped symmetrical curve, as you see on this chart here. In this, quote, normal curve, the mean, median, and mode fall exactly at the same point, which is right in the center. So if you see that zero there, that means it's zero standard deviations away from the mean. So I'll say it again, that middle line represents the mean, median, and mode. So what we're going to do here is talk about what it is that you absolutely have to memorize. First, you need to know that each one of these jumps here, each one of these from the zero to the one with that little symbol to the two with that little symbol, that means one standard deviation. The next one is two standard deviations. The next one is three standard deviations away from the mean going both up and down the normal curve. So what you have to memorize, what I recommend that you memorize is that you memorize half of the curve. Anytime there is a normal distribution of scores, these percentages that you see here in the white and then in the black on the outside will always be the same in a normal distribution of scores. And so on the test, what they'll do is say in a normally distributed, I don't know, amount of test scores, blah, 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 blah. And then they'll give you more information. As soon as you see normal distribution of scores, you know that these percentages apply and you need to memorize them. So from zero to one standard deviation is 34.1. Okay. For the next one is 13.6. The next one's 2.1 and then 0.1%. But there's another percentage I want you to memorize from the mean line and all the way up is half the curve. It's 50%, okay? So those five percentages I want you to memorize because if you've got that memorized, it's easier to then do the math if we need to involve the other half of the curve. Just as simple as that. All right, skewed data. Skewed meaning off, different, not quote normal. It's not a normal distribution. It means that outliers are involved. And these are data points that lie at one extreme of the curve or the other, and they skew the data. Meaning if you have a normal distribution of test scores, but Sally got like 150% shouldn't be allowed, but hey, let's say she did, that totally skews the data and it's no longer going to be a normal distribution or a normal curve. You have to know both a negative and positive skew. And whether the skew is positive or negative is determined by where the outlier lies. So in a negative skew, which you see here towards on the left-hand side of our image, you'll see that the kind of dip or the tail, let's say, is on the what I call negative side. It's not really negative, but it's on the lower end because we think a negative number is a lower number, right? So the outlier, the extreme data point is on the low end. Whereas in a positive skew, the extreme data point is on the higher end or what I call positive because it's higher than the lower numbers. So which measure of central tendency is actually most impacted by the outlier? That's an interesting one, right? So I want you to remember that on a normal distribution of scores, the mean, median, and mode all fall on the same line. So look at the skewed curves, the skewed data. Which one goes the farthest away from what would be like the peak of the distribution? I'm hoping you see that it's the mean. The mean is actually the most unreliable uh, measure of central tendency because it's most impacted by outliers. All right, so we're done talking about difference, or I'm sorry, descriptive statistics. Now let's talk about inferential, which allow you to infer. This involves estimating what is happening in a sample population for the purpose of making decisions about the population's characteristics. It's based in probability theory. 
that's a lot of like big terms that even I'm like, uh, what? It just means that you get to infer from your sample to your population. That's all it means. So basically, inferential statistics allow us to say, if it worked for this population or for this sample, we can estimate that it will work for the rest of the population. So for instance, drug testing. If the meds worked for the sample, we estimate they will have the same effects for the, same, for the rest of the population. That's it. It allows them to generalize. There is always a chance for error in whatever the findings may be, so the hypothesis and results must be tested for significance. We can't just assume that because this guy did everything he was supposed to do in research that, yep, it's true. No, we have to use statistics to test to make sure that it actually happened, that it's actually true, meaning it is significant. One of the ways that we need to really do this is really before we even conduct the research in the first place, and that's with a null hypothesis. A null hypothesis states that there is no difference between the two sets of data, meaning it's like the opposite of your actual hypothesis. The purpose of the null is that until the research shows by proving the original hypothesis that there is a difference, the researcher must assume that any difference present is due to chance. Until the end, when they know they've proven it, they have to assume that the difference is due to chance or else there's bias involved there. Okay, this chart is kind of a lot, so I encourage you to pause it and just kind of digest it, but let's kind of look at this chart here. Over on what is like the y-axis, you could say over here, it's the decision the researcher makes. They either reject the null, meaning they accept the original, or they accept the null. And then up top is the truth about what's going on, the truth about the population, that the null is either true or false. And then within there, you have either a correct decision or a type 1 or type 2 error. So with a type 1 error where they reject the null, choosing the original, but the null is actually true, oh, they made a big mistake. Then a type 2 error where they accept the null, but the null is false, another big mistake, right? So let's look at this in real word terms, real world terms. Let's say the original hypothesis is that a patient exhibits signs, symptoms of appendicitis, meaning their appendix is about to explode. Therefore, the appendix needs to be surgically removed. That's the original hypothesis. A medical doctor has, to, they have to consider the null with any surgery. So the null would be appendicitis is not the reason for the symptoms. Therefore, the appendix does not need to be removed. They've got to consider both. So let's go through each one here. Let's say that they accept the original, it's appendicitis, but actually the null is true, meaning they remove the appendix, but the patient has unnecessary surgery and could result in malpractice. Oh, that's not good. If they accept the null and the null is true, they've made the correct, sur the correct decision. Unnecessary surgery is avoided. They investigate other potential causes to figure out what's going on. Now, they make another correct decision here if the appendix is removed and the patient fully recovers, right? They accept, or I'm sorry, accept the original and the null is actually false. Like, that's a good thing, right? And then the last one with a type 2 error, they don't remove the appendix, but it actually is appendicitis, the appendix explodes and risks the patient's death. Whew, that's not good. All right, a really big term that we need to take a deep breath and know that we can understand this because it really is so simple if you approach it that way, okay? So get yourself in a good place and let's talk about this word, statistical significance. All right. The difference observed between your experimental control group, teachers who drink caffeine and teachers who don't, is probably not due to chance, right? It's actually due to a real difference between the groups, which if you've done your job, you've controlled for all the other stuff that could be impacting their alertness, is the independent variable. It is caffeine impacting the dependent variable of alertness. 
if you can determine that through statistical formulas and stuff that I'm not taking the mental space or time to understand, and nor do you have to for this course, then you know what statistical significance is. That's it. It's just, it means that data is, quote, significant when the likelihood of the difference between your experimental and control group being due to chance is less than 5%. So when you have a difference between an alertness of your experimental control group and it's less than 5% of it is due to chance and it's actually due to your independent variable, then you have statistically significant research or data. So in other words, there's a 95% likelihood that any difference is due to your independent variable, and that's right where you want it. So the numerical value for this, it's called a p-value, and then it has to be less than or equal to 0.05 or 5%, meaning p is like chance, let's say, and only 5% or less of the difference is due to chance. Again, meaning that the rest, 95% or more, is due to the independent variable. This is important because if research is statistically significant, it means the results are probably not a fluke or due to chance that you've actually got something. And if you don't actually have something, you're not going to publish it in all kinds of articles and be known for all your research because it really means nothing. All right, guys, that's what we've got for statistics. Thanks so much for joining me on this journey of scientific foundations of AP psychology. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If it has, please make sure you subscribe to my channel. You can follow me on TBT to get a hold of these slides or even the notes that accompany these videos. And stay tuned for the next unit where we explore biological bases of behavior. Until next time.